Wow, have I got some insider knowledge for you guys. You are not going to want to miss out on this. Fatal shark attacks in Egypt's Red Sea are unfortunately a near yearly occurrence these days. This body of water, which is renowned for its coral reefs and spectacular marine life, is a major hub for Egypt's tourism industry and, by definition, super important for the country's economy. It's not hard to imagine then how the deaths of tourists from ocean predators might end up being quite damaging for a country that heavily relies on that industry. And when I say heavily relies, I mean it. The tourism industry as a whole brings in about $30 billion in revenue to Egypt's economy every single year. But there's no denying the Red Sea has some kind of shark bite slash shark attack cluster issue going on, and there's a clear human wildlife conflict going on there. But the question that so many people are rightfully asking is what's actually being done about it? So come with me today as we dive into the cluster shark attacks of Egypt. We'll explore why it might be happening in the first place. And then a bit later on, I'll give you the inside scoop on what Egypt's Ministry of Environment is doing about it. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. So we've got another shark attack based video that we're doing again today, which I'm sometimes a bit hesitant about because there's so many other cool topics that we could talk about revolving around sharks. But I've always said to you guys, I only tend to make videos revolving around this topic when I feel like I've got something important or informative to say that I think you guys at home might benefit from learning about. And after a random conversation with another shark scientist that I had a few weeks ago, the information that I've got for you guys today, I think is super interesting. Now we've covered a couple of Egypt shark attacks from the last few years on the channel before, and I imagine you guys would probably agree they've been fairly gruesome. But if we go back from around 2008 onwards, Egypt has seen a number of fatal and non-fatal attacks. Within the 17 year period from 2008 and present day, by my count, there's been at least 25 shark attacks with eight of those resulting in fatalities. That's about a 30% fatality rate, which is about three times higher than the global fatality rate of 11%. So you can see that Egypt and the Red Sea is not only a cluster hotspot, but also a deadly one as well. Importantly here, even though there's this cluster of incidents, it doesn't on the face of it seem to be something that is dramatically increasing. It seems to be relatively steady year on year. That's what the data suggests anyway. Now, we could speculate for days as to why the Red Sea is particularly deadly for its attacks, but for me, it's largely down to the species involved. The vast majority of all of these incidents over the years have been either down to oceanic white tips or tiger sharks. To be fair, makos do reportedly crop up every now and again, but more often than not, it's those first two. And when you look at tiger sharks and oceanic white tips, they both do check out as common species implicated in shark attacks globally. And from a behavior perspective, it's largely down to them both being relatively large predatory sharks who are both also opportunistic predators, as in they eat what they can to survive. The oceanic white tip is a pelagic species that doesn't really know where its next meal is coming from, so it pays to investigate novel objects in their environment. And then tiger sharks are the most opportunistic shark species of all, feeding on basically anything. The non-fatal incidents in the Red Sea have usually been attributed to oceanic white tips, who have normally bitten once or twice and then swum off. And then the fatal incidents are usually attributed to the tiger sharks who on some of those occasions have entirely consumed the victims. Over the years, so many people have speculated as to why these sharks in Egypt seem to be biting people, myself included, and there's just a bunch of different reasons. You've got environmental conditions like sea temperature or distribution of natural prey species. You've got topography, so that's the physical characteristics of the environment. For example, reef drop-offs that go into really deep water. There's the tourism aspect as well, so lots of people are visiting the area for holidays and end up going in the sea on their holiday. And then hand in hand with tourism, you've got the issues with shark feeding. So people are throwing food scraps into the water to try and draw the sharks in, which as it stands is banned in Egypt, but you can bet it's still happening in isolation. Then we've got some scientists who have speculated on the impact that overfishing is having as well. So fish stocks are massively depleted in the Red Sea, which might be forcing sharks to explore different items in their environment as potential food sources. And then finally, you've simply got the behavior of the sharks themselves. So are some of these individual sharks particularly bold or aggressive in their personality, which might make them potentially more dangerous to a human. All of those things that I've just mentioned to you there could be playing a role or facilitating these incidents. It might just be one of them, although it's probably more likely to be lots of them working in tandem. The issue here though is that for Egypt, there's an inherent lack of data and without that data, we can't understand the problem to be able to solve it. When these incidents have happened down the years, a lot of the evidence normally isn't that clear. Sometimes officials haven't even been able to decipher exactly which species was responsible for the bite. So they end up just saying, oh yeah, it was one of these three or one of these two. And that right there is a problem. <laughs> because if you don't even know the exact species that was responsible, you can't effectively mitigate that risk. You just can't. You can put in some broader measures, sure, but you can't tailor it specifically. So this is where the Egyptian government, or more specifically, the Ministry of Environment, have been heavily criticized in the past. You could probably say that for many years, they buried their heads in the sand and didn't really address it properly. In the past, they've had the tendency to somewhat downplay the problem and just kind of brush it under the carpet.
carpet with a few apparent quick fixes like temporary beach closures or unselective shark culling. And those things right there don't actually address some of the root causes of the problem. Some would say they've tried a little bit more in recent years by tightening up measures on divers and beachgoers, for example, bringing in rules on shark feeding or implementing cordoned off swimming zones. But we can see it still doesn't solve the problem. I've definitely seen videos of tourists chucking in food to the sharks to try and draw them in. And then the whole cordoned off swimming zone thing, sure, yeah, it's all well and good. But Vladimir Popov wasn't stopped by authorities from swimming outside a swimming zone and he was killed by a shark. You might say there, well, that's a Darwin Award and yeah, he probably shouldn't have swum outside that swimming zone, but the root problem here is still unsolved. Swimming zones were put in place to try and stop shark attacks, but someone was still attacked and killed by a shark. See what I mean? So Egypt's Ministry of Environment, and I'd also probably say Egypt's Ministry of Tourism, has been rightly criticised for maybe not doing enough here. Although it does look like things are about to change, and hopefully some solutions and risk management strategies are just around the corner. I was having a chat with shark attack specialist Eric Kluwer the other day, as we're nearing publication for our research paper, and he mentioned to me that he's been working with the Egyptian authorities authorities on this very issue. Thankfully, he told me a little bit about it and he gave me permission to explain to you guys exactly what's going down. It turns out he actually approached the Ministry of Environment a few years back, but at the time they just didn't want to know. Although after the latest incident in late 2024 with the Italian tourist, they actually reached out to him. And after a few chats back and forth, they agreed that Eric would head over to Egypt in June to start a large scale tagging program for predatory sharks in the Red Sea. The idea here is to tag predatory sharks like oceanic white tips and tiger sharks with pop-up archival tags, or Patsat tags as I like to call them here on the channel. And on this first trip, Eric and his team captured 14 sharks, and of those 14, they tagged eight oceanic white tips and one tiger shark in five days, which is pretty good going. Okay, they'll want some more tags in tiger sharks for sure, but it's not half bad. These tags will stay on the sharks hopefully for about a year before popping off and then being retrieved, at which point there's going to be a decent movement data set for oceanic white tip sharks at least, to see how they're using different areas of the Red Sea. For example, are the oceanic white tips quite resident, i.e do they stay on the same islands in the Red Sea for most of the year, or do they move between different islands? We just don't have that information yet, so to know that will give us a good idea of how they're using the area, both in space and time. Now, while movement data or basic ecology information is a great thing to have, it doesn't really give us the fine-scale information that we need when we're looking at shark attacks and mitigating that risk. So as well as those satellite tags, they've also attached a few very, very small permanent tags into the shark's dorsal fin, which allows for a different project they've got in mind. And that particular project is going to be a citizen science photo identification project. We've chatted about citizen science before and it's such a useful tool for a scientist because it means you've got thousands and thousands of potential data collectors out there. The Red Sea is an absolute mecca for diving and snorkeling and all of those divers and snorkelers head under the waves with their underwater cameras and GoPros capable of capturing pictures and videos of the sharks that they see. So those really small permanent tags that have been placed in the shark's dorsal fins are a combination of colors that can be easily recognized in a photo or a video. The tags themselves which look like this are called Floyd tags and were designed by Hadrian Weidenbach, one of Eric's students, as part of his PhD. Great work, Hadrian. These are awesome. Anyway, what's really cool about these little spaghetti looking tags is that they almost work like a supermarket barcode and can be identified at a depth of at least 20 meters. The colors have been specially selected to be unique to each individual that they've been placed on, so you don't have to be able to read the tiny serial number. You can just look at the color combination. And it means that if one of these sharks ends up biting a person and someone takes a picture or a video of that shark, either during the event or just after it, we can identify that shark down to the individual level. The citizen science project part of it though just massively increases your chances of photographing that particular individual. There's also talk of developing or using some existing AI software that will be able to automatically sift through all of these images that people take and pick out individual sharks from their dorsal fins. I imagine the question though that lots of you might be asking at home is what is all of this going to do to help us understand these attacks? And I'd say the biggest one straight off the bat here is being able to prove whether these individual individual sharks that do end up biting people are responsible for multiple bites. There's already evidence out there that three oceanic white tip shark attacks over the space of three days in the Red Sea back in 2009 were from the same single female individual. So it can and does happen and that citizen science photo identification project as well as the tagging stuff might help us identify more of these bolder individuals within the population. As to what happens after that, well that's for the Egyptian government to decide. But as it stands the relevant authorities of Egypt look to be doing something about this. They're willing to put 
put their faith in the specialists and importantly, willing to put some money into some of these projects. That right there is what we love to see. Governments, scientists and citizens all working together to achieve a common goal. And that goal in this case here is understanding more about large predatory Egyptian sharks, their movements around the Red Sea and their behaviour. I think when you're looking at really important issues like this, the solutions that you get to have to be data driven solutions. And it looks like soon there's going to be a lot more data to work with here. It's good to see it to be fair. I honestly didn't expect this from the Egyptian government. I thought we were going to see a lot more head burying like we're maybe seeing in the Bahamas, another place that tends to have shark bite clusters as well. Although that's definitely a topic for a different day. Now, just a minute ago, I told you about some of the evidence that we had for individual sharks being responsible for multiple bites on humans. It's a mega interesting area of research that's going on at the moment called shark profiling. And I tell you all about it in this video here. There's a few case studies in that video that are pretty mind blowing. One with an oceanic white tip shark that I mentioned to you guys, but another one with a tiger shark called Lagatha. So make sure you go and check it out here.